So hello everyone, my name is Christine Grant and I am, uh, I say my day job, but my original job is professor of chemical and biomolecular engineering at North Carolina State University. And my last position there was associate dean of faculty advancement in the College of Engineering. I'm now currently serving as a uh, National Science Foundation program director for broadening participation in engineering in the engineering education and centers uh, division within the engineering directorate. And I guess because I have so much to say, I'm going to give a disclaimer that these, some of the things I'm going to talk about in the slides do not represent the National Science Foundation, although I am going to talk to you about some of the National Science Foundation programs. Uh, these comments are, are really coming from my experiences. So let me just say that up front. Um, so I'm going to talk to you today about reimagining a more equitable tenure system to recruit and support faculty. And I have a lot of things I could talk about. I'm gonna mix up, uh, mix things in from my own personal experiences and also um, from some literature sources as well. So there are some guiding questions that were associated with this session. Um, the first is how can the tenure process be demystified to support a more diverse and inclusive faculty? Um, what are the success strategies and pathways to recruit and prepare URMs for the STEM professorate? And you see, I now have an asterisk there based on the conversation and the presentation by uh, Dr. Asai earlier, uh, where I referred to peer, persons excluded because of ethnicity or race. I thought that was a really cool um, designation. Um, what are some more uh, what are some inclusive mentoring practices that can be leveraged, in, leveraged to aid in the transition from graduate school to postdoc to becoming a faculty? And then what are some of the evidence-based practices to aid STEM faculty? Uh, and how can we assist new faculty? So I'm gonna actually focus on two elements here. Um, I'm gonna focus on let's see, where is it? the first one and the last one based on some of my experiences. So let me tell you a little bit about myself. This is my, some of you may have seen this before. This is my famous hair slide, okay? This is my hair slide because it, it shows how my hair changed over time, but also it is an indicator of my confidence level. So when I first started as a faculty member, I um, wore my hair in a very traditional, you know, press. That's when I first started um, as a faculty member. Actually, this is when I was finishing graduate school. Uh, and then, um, let me see if I can stop this for a moment. Well, I'll come back to it. And then I actually uh, took these formal pictures in front of a bookshelf, you know, and this one here, I was married. And so I wanted people to know I was married. So I had my hand up about like that. And so, you know, I was very conscious of what image I was portraying when I was um, doing this. And some people laugh at this, but, and then after a while, you know, I had my wig and then I had my hair braided. And then I started to feel confident, confident with bringing the culture of who I was um, to my pictures that officially represented me. Now that doesn't mean I wasn't confident in my culture. I mean, back in this time here, I was wearing my hair in braids, but I didn't want to take an official picture with braids. So I love to talk about this picture because it talks about how I evolved over time and feeling comfortable bringing my whole self to the, the academy. So this, this timeline here actually is, um, represents what happened. So I joined NC State as an assistant professor in 1989 after getting my PhD from Georgia Tech in chemical engineering. So I joined the chemical engineering department and then all kinds of, you know, I can't even tell you what happened in here. <laughs> all kinds of stuff happened and then I got tenure. We might touch on a few of those things here, but, um, and then I found my voice in leadership, research and extension, um, doing things at the national level. And then I was promoted to full professor and I felt empowered to lead became associate dean of faculty advancement. Actually, that was a position that I proposed to the dean based on feeling that there was a need for that to help our faculty. And then working on creating community. And one of the things that was not mentioned um, in my, in, well, it's, I think it's in my bio, is that I'm now the um, president-elect of the American Institute of Chemical Engineers. So that's an organization that has about 40 to 50,000 members in 100 plus countries. And so, um, so moving through this time frame. Uh, is, is important to see that early on, I had the fellowship of African-American women uh, in, at NC State. I was the only African-American woman professor in, I was the first and the only one in the whole College of Engineering. 
was the only one for 16 years. So I had the fellowship of African-American women who were outside of my department, outside of my college across campus. I had a lot of coaching and mentoring. Um, you'll see a little bit about that in my talk during my time as an assistant professor. Had a lot of external advocates that were helpful. They were letter writers. They were just people who allowed me to come and do a mini sabbatical at their place. And then national leadership roles, which I talked about, and then internal leadership being a, uh, an associate dean. So that's my journey. I'm gonna give you a little snippets of, of pieces of that and along the way, give you some advice. So this is, um, some element of this is from this book chapter. I wanted to give you um, some information about um, doing a reflective piece. So after being in the academy for 30 years, I actually had an opportunity to write a book chapter called Rediscovering Our Original Selves. What did we leave behind and pick up on the journey to success? And I was taking 30 days off and I wrote this chapter about elements of my journey, things that I didn't realize had happened to me. So this is from the book chapter. So after years of exposure to the concepts of unconscious bias, microaggressions and inclusivity and stereotype threat to name a few, the author penned the words, re reviewed the words penned over 20 years ago in her journals. Well, what does that mean? Well, I went through a lot as, a, as being the only one and the first one and just a lot of things. Some of the things that Dr. Sai talked about and some of you may have experienced or know people have experienced. And I wrote in my journal, but I didn't have the words to describe, to define what it was going through. So the unconscious bias, microaggressions, uh, elements of inclusivity or not, stereotype threat. I didn't know that that's what was happening to me. But when I went back to my journals that were written like 20, 25 years ago, I then could now put my actual experience in the, con in the context of these terms. And so this is something that I was able to do um, last year before the pandemic hit. Um, and I, I felt like my reality was redefined. Um, and there were elements of my journey that I suppressed because I didn't realize what was really happening to me. And I had forgotten about some of the stuff I'd written in my journal. Um, so I think going back and allowing people to go back to find out what's happened um, is important. I do realize that when we talk about diversity, we're talking about all kinds of diversity from uh, race, gender, sexual identity, uh, gender identity, um, social economic, all types. I'm gonna talk about it from my lens um, as a, a woman of color. Um, and so, but realize that I do realize that there are other elements that we need to be considering. So one of the things that, that I wrote in this book was this idea of the STEM success cycle. The fact that you have to learn the rules, pay your dues, and then make it you. So you have to learn the rules to be successful, to get tenure, that's what we're talking about here. Pay your dues, you have to do what is required. And then you have to kind of make the process you or making this, you know, something that you want to do. Now there are other things in there, of course, other people helping and doing things as well. So let me, let's look at this first question. The first question is, how can the tenure process be demystified to support more uh, faculty? Um, I took this from the, the um, perspective of what, you can do as a faculty member and what people can do to help in the system. So the first thing is policies and procedures. It's important for policies and procedures um, to make sure that they don't have elements of unconscious bias, microaggression tendencies in them, just by the way they're written. Um, provide clarifying language, revisions and addendums for transparency and fairness, that's also important. And develop a training for, for faculty at all ranks uh, based on the best practices or promising practices for reappointment, promotion, and tenure, and post-tenure review. I'm actually writing a book chapter on post-tenure review in engineering right now. Thank you so Friday. much. <laughs> um, and then the next thing that needs to happen is that we need to build a community. We need to provide opportunities to have inclusive people building conversations as a part of the fabric of a college. We need to engage faculty I all right. I can't even turn my body. Academy. I'm in so much As pain. Probably. So I don't Somebody know what I need to do. You need to stretch out yourself. I did. I did an hour and a half. Okay. Um, and we need to promote scholarly visits by potential um, mentors or coaches for early career faculty. So they should be able to bring people who uh, look like them or don't look like them to come and do seminars and then provide a mentoring opportunity. Mentoring is, is at the core, at the heart of, of what I love. Um, we need to conduct authentic mentoring programs, celebrate exemplars in the mentoring realm, and design and promote a peer mentoring program. So I've been fortunate to receive the AAAS Mentor Award and also the Paisman Award from NSF. And it's actually a result of the mentoring I did, but also the mentoring that was done to me, that I felt a need and a, um, to, to pass that on. And then in the terms of reviews and, and evaluations, 
um, maximize the opportunities to clearly communicate, communicate excuse me, strengths and weaknesses during annual reviews for um, folks who are on a tenure track. And I'm sure there are people who are on a non-tenure track faculty who are a part of the community that's watching this as well. Um, but whatever we need to, to do to make sure that everybody clearly understands what the strengths and weaknesses are and provide updates and keep faculty on the loop, in the loop um, on subtle and major changes in the participants in the reviews. In other words, if the policy changes and it's not no longer gonna be just a core set of three faculty who are gonna be over reappointment promotion and tenure, but it can't, instead it's gonna be six or eight or 10 faculty, faculty need to know that as the rules are changing so they can adjust accordingly. So what are some evidence-based practices to aid STEM faculty in improving skills and enhance their scholar identity? Well, one of the things that I talked about earlier was the fact that I was associate dean, uh, the inaugural associate dean of faculty development. So we developed a unit within the College of Engineering, didn't exist before I started it about 13 years ago, to empower all faculty um, to be successful and to have um, faculty well-being. So the interim associate dean right now, Lana and Asaf, is Joel Dukas. But this is my team, and it was supported by uh, the dean. You know, obviously we are working in a lot of different realms, right? So recruiting um, people who are coming to visit, we need to make sure that we do a good job of getting them the exposure to people that they need to talk to, um, and if they're in a certain community that they want to meet folks in that community. If you're a woman faculty member potential woman faculty member, you may want to meet other women. Maybe, maybe not. We should give our candidates the opportunity to do that. Um, then what we did is we did a lot of career resource development, taking faculty on trips to funding agencies, helping them with their career roadmap, uh, promotion. Uh, I was in charge of reappointment, promotion, and tenure, and post-tenure review, and working on regulations at the um, college and the, the um, university level. And then retention, making sure that we do faculty care pivot awards for mid-career faculty to kind of move into different realms, and then leadership training, and of course, retirement. So what is important for, to make this happen? You need to have the commitment of leadership support. You need to have dollars, resources, faculty, staff, based leadership. You need to cultivate a community practice. We were able to do that because we have over 350 faculty now. Um, so we do coaching, mentoring, and sharing of best practices. And we were kind of growing it as we went along. And if things didn't work, we would take them out of the system. And then there were challenges and roadblocks and potholes along the way uh, in, in doing this. But as associate dean, I sat at the, the college level with all of the other associate deans. So I was kind of equivalent to them, so to speak. Uh, and well, I was equivalent, but I was, and I was also working with the department heads on the executive committee in the College of Engineering. So what you're gonna see next is, well, these are just kind of some of the things that I did. I've always an advocate at the university level, um, collaborating with the associate deans, working on national broadening participation initiatives. And then I was also responsible for leading the five-year uh, review process for a few of the department heads. The, if the thing that's really interesting though, if you look at these pictures that are coming up now, um, if you look at the things we did, having a, a career workshop, uh, NSF career workshop, a research development course, visits to funding agents. If you look at these pictures, you'll see that they're very diverse. So while we did some things that were specific to women faculty and specific to minority faculty or faculty of color or uh, teaching track, this is the teaching track faculty, I tried my best to be inclusive by making sure I had people who were speaking and people who were participating so that it was diverse. So we didn't have to have these separate sessions, which are important. Those are important to build community. I wanted all my faculty to come together and because I was very strategic and intentional about that, I think that we, we had a very diverse um, set of faculty participating in our activities. So that's important. Um, so next question was, what are some successful strategies and pathways to recruit and prepare URMs or peer faculty for the STEM professor? And what are some inclusive mentor practices? I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on that, on, on this. Um, I'm going to talk, I'm gonna give you a couple of examples. Some of you know about this. Uh, there are these building future faculty programs that exist. We have had one at North Carolina State University uh, for years where we bring in uh, postdocs and graduate students who are thinking about becoming faculty, bring them through a day or two of activities and then something very specific. So this was for College of Engineering. 
So we, some of these people you may recognize, I know a few of them have actually become faculty uh, and they talk about the importance of programs like that. The other thing is that once the, we have a, or we have had a minority graduate student, minority engineering graduate student association or MEGSA, getting together with these students and, and talking to them about career elements. I mean, it doesn't take a lot to do. Um, and again, these are important elements uh, for success of this, these particular groups. Um, there are a lot of decision points that people uh, face along the way. Uh, these are two of my colleagues, uh, Professor Maria Mayorga joined NC State in 2013, but she was at Clemson in the Department of Industrial Engineering for a number of years. And Iris Rivera, who's the head of the RIT Industrial Engineering, uh, Industrial Systems Engineering Department, she was at Ohio State um, before that. So I'm not saying that you should move. Uh, I'm just saying that there may be times where you're gonna have to make a decision to come to a fork in the road and it won't be clear exactly where you're supposed to go. Uh, that's where mentors and coaches will come in. So here's some professional points that I want to, to share with you, um, professional points to ponder. So on the left side are what future and early career faculty could and should do. And the right side is what it, is the corollary that the administrators or faculty mentors could do. So find a mentor or coach. Actually, you'll need more than one. You'll need a constellation of mentors. Uh, for administrators, be a coach or mentor to one or many faculty, and they don't have to be in your institution. Um, learn the written and unwritten rules associated with the tenure process. There's stuff that's written in the book, and then there's what actually happens. Um, so, for, so basically, I'm giving you some professional points from my perspective. Um, for future and early career faculty, learn the written and unwritten rules, and then administrators and faculty mentors provide behind the scenes information as appropriate. I know when I was going up for promotion to full professor, I wasn't getting the information I needed from the people who should have been giving it to me. So I actually went to a department head in another department to ask him, and he gave me the information I needed. So sometimes you'll need to do that for folks. Keep track of all you do and don't do. I used to keep a list of, and she said no, because there's a lot of things that are gonna come your way, and some of you are going to have to say no to, but you might want to pick up later. So for administrators and faculty mentors, ask current and prospective faculty about what their priorities are and advise for potential course corrections if their priorities are not quite there. Uh, for also creating a sense or a community of allies and advocates, being proactive in professional relationship development. Don't wait till you need that letter for tenure before you start creating this community. And then for administrators and faculty mentors, be authentic in participating as an ally and an advocate in different networks. The other thing is um, to be prepared for awards and recognitions, which of course is very important in your portfolio. And then for administrators to sponsor faculty and coach on awards and recognition processes as appropriate. Um, be active in your professional society, determine your degree of engagement. And then for faculty mentors, teach the promising practices for faculty to engage um, in their professional societies and be willing to introduce new people to the fabric of the organization. Um, finally, know the timelines for applications, promotion, and other academic paperwork, and for administrators to facilitate timely submission and support on senior faculty, the leadership side. So the, the key is to pursue and perfect professional connections that are based on trust, authenticity, appropriate advocacy and honesty. So for building uh, your academic awards portfolio, take matters into your own hands, figure out what awards are good for you, ask people to be the front person for you offering to prepare the materials. Don't give up, you have to apply for things several times. The Paysman Award that I talked to you about, I think I was nominated for that three or four times before I actually got it. Um, and get, get feedback on your nomination statement and make friends wherever you go because you never know who's gonna be available to help you with that. Obviously, mentoring is important. I've talked about that. Um, Zakia is on this call somewhere, and she was the um, co-editor of a book that we, a group of African-American women faculty wrote um, based on a session that they did at the American Chemical Society. I wrote a chapter in there called Mentors, Mentors Everywhere, Weaving Informal and Formal Mentoring into a Robust Chemical Sciences Mentoring Quilt. So I talk a lot about formal and informal mentoring. We don't have time to do that today, but that's something that I think is important. And these are just some of my mentors. And the, the key thing to take away from this is that they don't all look like me. 
Some of them are men, some of them are white men, some of them are white women, but they all played a role in my own career success. And it's really important not to just say, oh, there's no other person that looks like me or that's doing research in my area. Go outside your institution, go outside your comfort zone to find the people who will be able to help you. So I'm gonna end up, I don't know how much time I have left, but I'm gonna quickly go through this last set. Um, broadening participation in engineering is my program. We're always looking for people to apply in that realm. Uh, we have, we don't have a deadline for submissions. Um, we are going through some, a uh, few changes. So kind of watch this space. There might be some new things that are coming along the way. Um, obviously we're trying to understand the barriers and transform engineering cultures and faculty can submit through the career program, planning grants, um, eager or travel or conference grants and workshops. We have a lot of different things that, that we support. Um, this is just a, a, a list. This I actually prepared for a conference where I was talking to a group of Latina women. So a lot of the things that I've focused on here have to do with that particular community. But here's one, broadening participation, engineering, um, qualitative study on Latina, Latina persistence in and beyond the degree, um, looking at retention and tenure for Black and Hispanic engineering faculty. And then there are also programs that we have that are workshops, um, that are workshop related. Um, there are programs that, <laughs> So many different programs at NSF. It includes um, the advanced program. Some of you are familiar with that. Um, there are, this is just a couple of projects that are in my portfolio. One, so the other thing I want to focus on here is you can get an NSF career award that is not in the traditional technical realm. So Jeremy London is an assistant professor in engineering education. She just got an NSF career award um, doing the work in Brian participation. Um, APLU um, has a report on um, broadening participation engineering status report of what's going on and what the numbers look like. So these are all things that are in our portfolio. And if you want to contact me, I can point you to some of these things as you're um, considering different things. We have HBCU programs, the HBCU EIR program is to increase support for researchers at HBCUs. And I get to um, manage elements of that for the engineering um, directorate. Um, and then one other thing I just got to hit the button on that I'm really excited about is the E-Fellows program, Engineering Postdoctoral Fellowship. It was an $18 million award. It is the first engineering postdoctoral um, program that we have sponsored by NSF. And these will be postdoctoral awards for up to, up to $75,000 a year. Very short time frame on this because we really want to get that going. We know that people are being impacted by COVID um, in this space as well. So let me just finish up by saying that there's a lot of things going on. Um, COVID-19 COVID has impacted a lot of us. Um, there are some reports that have come out from the National Academies on what the impact of COVID has been on women in academic science, engineering, and medicine. So go and look and you'll probably see parts of yourself out there. I know when I look at this, I say, yeah, that happened to me too. So there are a lot of reports and things going on um, in that realm. So I don't know how much time I have left, but I'm gonna end here. Uh, I was wanting, my goal was to give you some things to think about, some elements of my own journey, and I'd be willing to take some questions at this time. So thank you so much for, for staying. Um, okay, David had a question. Let me see. What can institutions do regarding department, college, and university p and evaluation criteria to promote DEI? Well, in my quest for information to write this chapter on post-tenure review, uh, I actually found, and I can't remember the name of it, I'm sorry, but there are actually institutions that have DEI in there as a, not a criteria, but as something that, that has to be reported on for tenure and promotion, which is really interesting. Um, I, I can't remember the institution, but what can institutions do? I think that um, making sure that people who are working on these committees to come up with these rules understand the elements of diversity, equity, inclusion. So when I became the person who was over um, reappointment, promotion, and tenure for the College of Engineering at NC State, which is like really funny because like there were people who didn't want me to get tenure, ha ha ha. Okay, anyway, <laughs> so years later, here I am running the process, which I think is funny. Um, so when it came time to run the meetings, because I had so much information in my toolkit from the NSF advanced program about unconscious bias and what people are doing, I was able to manage the concentration of those, the, 
the conversation in those meetings to make sure that we didn't get off topic. So you couldn't talk about the fact that a, a woman went out on maternity leave it's not, if it's not in her portfolio, right? So I think having the right people in the room who know enough about the essence of what we're talking about to manage or streamline the process so that it doesn't go off the rails, I think that's important. Um, we, for the first time, I think this past year, had another, or maybe it was two years ago, had the first ever woman that I had seen on the tenure, the college level committee besides me. And then we had a man of color, and then we had two men of color, and then we had a woman of color. And I don't think that was because of me, uh, because I don't get to select that comes from the department. So I think putting the right people in the room and having the right people in the room when you're discussing and managing policy. So for example, when we had to do something for um, non-tenure track faculty, which I hate, it's more professional track faculty. Uh, that's a better term. I actually had conversations with the teaching faculty to ask them what they thought should be in there. Then I had conversations with the department heads. And then I worked together with those groups as a bridge to try to come up with a policy that was um, going to meet the needs of both groups. So I think that if you have somebody who is aware and intentional in the room, they can help with the rules associated with um, this process and make sure that the process is fair. So I'll, I'll stop there. <laughs> Hopefully I answered your question. Um, Christine, you touched on something that Kevin brought up in the, in the chat earlier. He was, he was asking if um, focusing on tenure systems is the right focus. Um, since he was thinking of the growing majority ranks of non-tenure or as you said professional track faculty i was wondering if yeah. you could comment that on that yeah thank you thank you um kevin for that comment so you see you see i said tongue-in-cheek non-tenure track faculty which i hate that term because it means you're not something right and it's like no the, so american society for engineering education is and other elements and i think our university is moving towards using this term professional track, but then people are like, okay, so wait, what are we, not professional? So, you know, you can't, <laughs> you can never, you can never um, uh, satisfy everyone with terminology. I think that the key thing is that non-tenure track and adjunct faculty in some instances have been second-class citizens. They've received the brunt of a lot of the stuff that has to be done and they're not respected. And sometimes they're not even invited to faculty meetings. They're not allowed to come. To, you know, I can understand if you're not a, a tenure track person that you can't vote on tenure cases. However, if you are primarily a teaching faculty and the faculty is making decisions about coursework and uh, curricula and how we're gonna teach in what order, and you're teaching the lion's share of some element of the junior level courses or this, you should be in the room. So I think having people in the room is important because then they're part of that community and not second class citizens. The other thing is that um, it, at NC State, we actually, you can get promoted. So you can go from assistant to associate to full teaching faculty. So you go through, so now our teaching faculty go through the same um, committee, the reappointment, promotion and tenure committee as everybody else. They're just being promoted um, to without tenure, right? They also have to get external letters. So part of the discussion and dilemma we had was, do we require letters for teaching faculty to go from assistant to associate? We came down on saying no, but then from associate to full, yes, we need external letters, external to the university. And that will give them time to kind of build up their community and connections with people. So what I've tried to do in this answer is to give you some examples of where it has worked, where we have done um, some things that really celebrate and value uh, teaching track faculty in our institution. They come under the provost office. I think adjunct faculty maybe do not. Uh, those are contract. Uh, but again, every institution is different. So, um, and they, they do meet. And in, in our college of engineering, the teaching track faculty meet on a regular basis um, to support each other. So, okay, I probably spent too much time on that question, but hopefully that, that helped. Um, yeah, I like that continuing track faculty. Uh, that's great. Um, contingent faculty, okay. Um, how, how faculty at different career stages can contribute to the kinds of institutional change that we are discussing. I know some early career faculty that feel quite vulnerable, especially if they advocate for changes in the system of culture. What are your thoughts? Well, you know, if you're a tenure track faculty, your first job, job one is to get tenure. 
And I was told that when I got there, you know, your job, you know, that's great that you want to mentor the minority students. And I had a number of them that I mentored and talked to and had them in my labs. But job one was for me to get tenure. And why? Because now I can move through the ranks and be a leader and I can sit in a room and make policy. So I think that uh, depends on what you want to do. Now, for somebody else, that's like your strong suit and that's like defines who you are and, and you may not want to be as quote unquote conservative as I was. Um, however, you have to figure out what that is. And mentors and coaches can help you to ascertain whether you're you know erring on the side of too much or too little. And then you also have to figure out whether you're at the right institution that's gonna fit the value system that you have to move the needle, right? Sometimes when you're tenure track, you just gotta figure out ways, if you can get funding for it, then it counts, right? If you can get funding for it, then it counts in your portfolio. And again, I know there are people on this call from a lot of different types of institutions and a lot of different uh, position types. So consider the source. I am a full professor, I am tenured, and I'm at a, a research intensive institution. So it might be different at your school. Um, okay, let's see here. I actually prefer a non-tenure track for myself because it's only going to be, okay, okay. So um, I think I got all the questions. Okay, so any more questions? I mean, please feel free to unmute yourself and, and ask a question if you want to. Um, or just write something in the chat. Ooh, another message. Don't you all love when that little red thing comes up? You're like, ooh, new message. <laughs> okay, let's see here. So, how did you pick your mentors and did they? Oh, that's a great question. That's a great question. So, I am, okay, so I tell this story all the time. I discovered a new word a long time ago called um, introvert because I'm not one. <laughs> so I'm not an introvert. So, you know, it doesn't, it's no, no uh, problem with me going up to somebody who's a biggie wiggy in my field in the National Academy and saying, hi, my name is Christine Grant. I don't know if you remember me, but, and I do that a number of times when I see them in a point. Oh, of course I remember you, Christine, because it's kind of a ploy that I use, right? So I am not shy about going to people. Probably early in my career, maybe I was a little bit more shy or reserved about doing that. And I know shy and introvert is not the same thing. I do know that. So you have to come up with a strategy. You know, find a person who is in your field who's doing exactly what you want to do one day. I have a mentor you saw on there, Matt Terrell. I had a conversation with him some years ago about becoming a dean of engineering. And, you know, I'm not in that role and I'm, I'm not sure if that's something I'm interested in at this point. He said, Christine, if you don't become a dean of engineering before the age of 60, I still have a year or two. He said, it's like too late. Now, who's going to tell you that except somebody who's a dean of engineering, right? Now, you may not agree with what he said, but he was giving me sage advice. So, um, you know, find somebody who's doing the things you want and ask them to be your mentor or just start, just start talking to them about um, things and then eventually they may become your mentor. So I, uh, I don't know if there was anyone who chose me. Maybe there was. I, I don't know. Um, my, my favorite mentor is a guy who was a deacon at my church when I was um, an early career faculty. And he was a full professor in textiles across campus. I used to meet with him once a semester for lunch, totally out of the physical space that I'm in. And he used to look at my portfolio every semester and tell me whether I was on track or not. Because he was at the university level, you know, RPT committee. Um, but I would see him on Sundays, you know? I mean, so there was some, you know, social things going on there as well. Um, so yeah, there's, there's a lot of different ways that you can, you can find a mentor. Um, so did I, did I, um, oh, the various roles their uh, mentors might fill. Yeah, a constellation of mentors. You know, sometimes the people that are your mentors are, so you're, if you're in a department and you're a faculty member, your department head could be your mentor. And at the same time, your department head is gonna also evaluate you. So certain things you can't tell your department head, right? I also think it's important to have mentors in your back pocket. So I have people like, I talk about Matt Terrell and David Terrell who are both in the National Academy and they're like amazing guys. I talk about them now. However, years ago, I didn't. They were mentors that I had in my back pocket. They were people who quietly mentored me um, and they didn't talk about it either. But I was able, I was empowered to go into spaces and talk about stuff. And people didn't know that those guys were prepping and priming me for certain conversations. So I don't think it's, it, it's, 
sometimes you have to have these quiet mentors that are pretty powerful and they might just be advocates for you. Um, one of my favorite stories is um, um, one of my former chancellors, Marianne Fox, some of you might know, have known her, she just passed away. That's why I'm kind of pausing here because it's kind of emotional. She just passed away and she was the chancellor at NC State and I wasn't getting the right lab space. That's a whole nother story. Um, I wasn't getting the right lab space and things weren't going the way I was, you know, the white guys after me were getting like all this lab space and I wasn't, it's a whole nother story. I'm better now. See? Um, but I went to her house for a, a session for women faculty and I stayed afterwards and talked to her and told her what was going on. And I said, she said, what do you want me to do? I said, don't do anything, don't do anything. And she said, okay, well, I found out like many years later after she had gone to uh, be at um, UC San Diego on a panel, we had a session at Caltech um, and we had her and uh, President, former President Brown and the president of Caltech on a panel in front of all these people, including my dean, who's great, Lou Martin Vega. She told everybody that that night after she had that conversation with me and I told her to do nothing, she got on the phone right away and started calling around campus saying, what is going on with Christine Grant? Why is she her lab so, you know, I had no idea. That's what you call an advocate, right? Um, so anyway, oh, I guess we're, we're closing out. Um, Let's see. Oh, so we have two minutes. So maybe um, Mar Maria wrote in that over the last year, a lot of things have changed, some good, some not so good. How do we keep the good changes moving forward? And what do you see, if any, um, thing as the good changes? Yeah. So let me say before I answer that, uh, Baranda Montgomery is amazing and her stuff is amazing. So if you all have a chance to look at that, please do. Um, good changes are, I think we reconnected with our families. You know, we reconnected with, you know, how, how do we do work and what is really important and how do we do the things that we have to do? Um, I think the bad things are that a lot of women, a lot of stuff they had to do was more than they originally were uh, planning to do. So um, I can't answer that in 30 seconds. I'm, I'm sorry, Maria. Um, but uh, I think the fact that there were good changes and bad changes and acknowledging that and letting everybody define what those are is important for them and then figuring out how they want to act based on that. And I think that administrators need to ask themselves the same thing and ask their constituents the same thing. Um, Travis, advocate or sponsor? Yeah, lots of advocate, sponsor, ally, counselor, coach, mentor. I need them all. <laughs> anyway, I, I guess we're gonna go back. Thank you so much um, for, for being a part of this. I wish we could do it in per person and um, I look forward to meeting you all one day and uh, seeing you soon. So, and thank you, Jennifer, for keeping us on track. <laughs> Absolutely. Thanks so much for sharing that with 